cast out from before the children of Israel and the kings of Israel, which they had made. God drove out heathen. You ever wonder why God drove those people out of the promised land, and the Canaanites and the Hittites, etc., and, and why he drove them out of the promised land and put God's own people in there? Uh, you read about some of those things back in um, uh, the stories there. I think Leviticus talks about it and, and it, and he's telling them, don't do this and don't do that. And he lists some very abominable things. And then he says, for all these things have the nations, which I drive out before you, uh, they've done them. That's why the Lord got him out. And now God's own people are behaving in the same manner for which God kicked the heathen out of the promised land. And so that's what's going on here. Look at verse 9. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. Uh, that still goes on today. And they built them high places and all watchmen to the fenced city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away things to provoke the Lord to anger. Here they are worshiping the same gods that couldn't deliver, that couldn't deliver themselves, couldn't deliver their own people from God's people. Now they're going back after those things. Twelve, for they served idols. I mean, look, if any folks knew better, Israel knew better than this. He had given it to them clearly in the Ten Commandments. Um, commandment number two, which um, I didn't learn as a kid growing up in the Catholic Church. They taught me Ten Commandments, but they left that one out took commandment number 10, divided it up into two parts and made one, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and thou shalt covet, not covet thy neighbor's goods. And they left out the one about bowing down to idols and serving idols and making idols because it hit a little too close to home. God's people knew it. The Lord's people knew it. And now here they are, verse number 10, setting them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burned incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them. He keeps repeating that thought. Like, uh, these guys should have had more sense. And wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. Not only like these guys should have had more sense, like, well, we better make sure we got enough sense or more sense than they did. For they served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, ye shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. God's giving them instruction, giving them fair warning. They know what they're supposed to do. There's no question about it. They just chose not to do it. 14, notwithstanding, after all the preaching that they got, notwithstanding, they would not hear. Now, notice it's important. It's not they could not hear. They would not hear. It's a matter of the will. Notwithstanding, they would not hear, but harden their necks. And God warns you about that. Proverbs 29, verse 1, he that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. This is about where Israel is. But harden their necks like to the neck of their fathers. They did not believe in the Lord their God, that did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant they, that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain. You, you become like that thing which you follow. And when after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them, they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshiped all the host of heaven and served Baal. I, I tell you, like I said, these guys, were, these guys were a mess. And the Lord's just telling them like it is, saying, this is how you want to behave. This is, this, I'm just going to lay it out there for everybody to see. And this is their heritage. This is not the legacy you want to leave for somebody to read about you, uh, what, thousands of year, years after you're gone. Amen. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments. Now they're getting into uh, witchcraft and so forth. And sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore, because all that, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. 19, uh, that'd have been nice if it stopped there. 19, also Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel, which they made. So the apostasy started uh, in the northern tribes in Israel, and then it proceeded also to the south in uh, southern tribes in Judah as well. God's people, which he had uh, given, chosen where David was from and Solomon, uh, that 
tribe was going to be a light. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel, verse 20, and afflicted them and delivered them into the hand of spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. Again, what a mess. It's like the Lord couldn't stand to look at them there in his land, behaving like that, and got them, as it says here, out of his sight. Uh, just a bit more, verse 21, for he rent Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king, and Jeroboam drave Israel from following the Lord and made them a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did, they departed not from them. All right? the sins of Jeroboam. The sins of Jeroboam uh, that are mentioned here had to do with, among other things, uh, first of all, the two infamous golden calves that he made, setting one in Bethel and one in Dan. Um, Aaron made the children of Israel one. Uh, Jeroboam does them one better and, and makes them two. And so these things were a snare and a sin uh, to the Israelites. The other thing that Jeroboam did is he made him priests of the lowest of the people, uh, priests that were not of the sons of Levi. So you got base people, weren't living right. They weren't uh, of the Levites. They should not have been priests, but uh, he made him priests out of the folks that he chose. All of that, and we won't go and look at it right now, but all of that's in 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 25 through 31. And here in 2 Kings chapter 17, I mean, that's, when, that's, when, that's when Jeroboam did this. First king. Here in 2 Kings chapter 17, some 250 years later or so, Israel is still following these sins of Jeroboam. And because of that, verse 22 uh, it says, For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants the prophets. So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. Now, then here, a hundred and some years before the more famed um, Babylonian captivity, uh, Israel experiences uh, another captivity prior to that, uh, this Assyrian captivity. And because of their sins and because of their idolatry, God had removed Israel from their homeland and he allowed them to be carried away captive uh, by the Assyrians into Assyria. So now they've left. Of course, we're, we're more familiar with the 70 year Babylonian captivity, you know, where you find Daniel and uh, the three Hebrew children in Babylon and, and read about it in the book of Daniel. But, but here's this other captivity. Uh, where they're taken away into Assyria. Now, you might recall also back in 1 Kings, you remember um, the wicked king Ahab, and he ruled uh, there for a while. Um, uh, Israel, the, the, again, the northern tribes, and he ruled them back there at that time from Samaria. And uh, that's 1 Kings 16, 29, where you can read about that. But here in 2 Kings chapter 17, you can also see uh, Samaria as Israel's uh, territory. 2 Kings 17, verse 1, it says, In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, began Hosea, the son of Elah, to reign in Samaria over Israel nine years. So uh, Samaria at that point in Israel territory, Israelite territory, somehow by the time you get to the New Testament, the um, Samaritans have become a people of their own, um, uh, as we understand, the, like, like half-breed people, and the Jews didn't have any dealings with the uh, Samaritans. So uh, here uh, you got Samaria figuring into this. And at the time of their carrying away into Assyria, uh, Israel had also then again been occupying Samaria. So when Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, came and he got Israel, uh, he removed them from Samaria. Uh, he removed Israel from Samaria. Now the Lord, a little bit later, you know, in chapter 18, kind of make your way over there, he, he's going to give us, after even some more details, he's going to give us if you will, a, a brief post-mortem summary of these events in uh, just a few verses here in 2 Kings 18, beginning in verse number 9. And he says this, And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of three years they took it, even in the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken, and the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria and put them in Halah and in Habor by the river of Gozan. 
and in the city of the Medes. Why? 12. Uh, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant and all that Moses, a servant of the Lord, commanded them and would not hear them nor do them. This is the reasoning for which God did these things. There is no doubt about it. There is no question about it. God did this to Israel because of their sin and because of their worshiping of other gods. At the time of this captivity, not only did the king of Assyria remove Israel from Samaria, but at the same time, so that the land would be occupied, he took men from other nations and he put them in Samaria. So, you know, something could still be going on there. And they occupied the land. So we'll read about that back in chapter 17 and verse number 24. 2 Kings 17, 24. And the king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Cuthah and from Ava and from Hamath and from Sepharvim and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. So God's people are moved out and some other heathen people from heathen nations are put in there. Uh, they're going to still make use of this land. After this happened, um, because now you got heathen in land that belongs to God, and uh, they're, they're behaving after their heathen ways, uh, the Lord sees fit to uh, intervene. Look at verse 25. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. In God. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he has sent lions among them, and behold, they slay them, because they knew not the manner of the God of the land. Well, they seemed to understand what was going on and why it was going on. And, I mean, look, you, you don't want to trifle with the Lord. And, and here, these guys, heathen people living after their heathen ways in the land that belongs to God. You, you don't take that which belongs to God and use it for something else. And the Lord sent lines among them. I know a man in uh, a king named Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5 who took some of God's vessels and used them to party with, and the Lord uh, showed him the writing on the wall, did he not? Yeah. <laughs> and said, buddy, your days are numbered. Get ready because uh, you're not long for this earth. And he wasn't. So the Lord intervenes, he, he sends lines among them, the, they find that the, the, the messengers see what happens, they, bring, they interpret it rightly, look, they're in God's land, they don't know the manner of the God, they, they said God with a capital G there of, of land, and so he sent lines among them, and, 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 and the lines are killing the people, and they're reporting this to the king, and so the king now processes this information, and in verse 27, um, here's his response, here's what he's going to do about it. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom ye brought from them. Carried away in the captivity. I want you to take him and carry, carry that thither one of the priests whom ye brought from thence and let them go and dwell there and teach them the manner of the God of the land. That's pretty wild. You're thinking about it. And what's going on right now is because of what has transpired, this heathen king this king of Assyria worships, I mean, worships false gods. He is sending a biblical scriptural missionary back to the land to teach the heathen that he had planted there about the true and living God on his dime, right? I mean, he's, he's sponsoring it. So, so that's what's going on. Verse 28, then one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came back and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear the Lord. That's, that's shorten your deputation time right there. And so he did. They did. And, of course, you know, um, old habits die hard. And so we read this in verse 29. Howbeit, even though he did that, every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made, every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. And the men of Babylon made uh, Sukkoth Benoth, and the men of Cuth made Nergal, and the men of uh, Hamath made uh, Shima, and the Avites made Nibhaz and Tartak, and the Sepharvites burnt their children in fire to Adramelech 
and Anamlek, the gods of Sepharvim. And again, just, uh, just a mess. And all these nations that had been brought to Samaria to replace the Israelites, um, they began to fear God, but they didn't continue to fear him. And they failed at the same time to forsake their old religious practices. Verse 33, go to verse 33. It says, they feared the Lord and served their own gods. So it wasn't like they were taking, it wasn't like they were taking God as their God. They were just adding him to their list of uh, many gods that they had. And they feared him, but they kept serving the other gods. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away uh, from, from thence. <clears throat> they also followed some of Jeroboam's bad examples back in verse 32. So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the house of the So as we get to where we're about to go, this is the backdrop upon which these things are set. Verse 33, we, we read, they feared the Lord and served their own gods. Verse 34, this is where we started a little while ago in, in our text. Unto this day they do after the former manners. They fear not the Lord, neither do they after their statutes or after their ordinances or after the law and commandment which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob whom he named Israel. Their, their old gods won out is what happened. And their fear of the Lord that they had was short-lived. And so now we come to uh, verses 35 and verse uh, 36, which we'll look at in more detail in a moment. These two verses speak of the covenant that God had made with his own people, Israel, and the charge that he had given them. And, and this covenant, um, the king of Assyria, uh, when he sent, he had, this is what he had, the, the missionary that he sent back, this is what he taught them. He taught him these things because he went back to teach him the way to how to serve and worship the manner of the, the living God. And so this was, this was instruction he would have given them. And uh, this is what God had told them to do. And this is what God's people failed to do. And this is what the uh, people that were inhabiting uh, Samaria, these other nations, they also failed to do, even though they were taught uh, these things. Um, now the covenant. And in verse 35, he says this. With whom the Lord had made a covenant and charged them, saying, Ye shall not. Now, God, God has to start there with thou shalt not. There's some things you're not supposed to do. The Christian life, if we were to kind of make it real simple, there's some things we're not supposed to do. There's other things we are supposed to do. And that may be oversimplifying it some, but, but it is a part of it. And he's starting with things they weren't supposed to do. <clears throat> with whom the Lord had made a covenant and charged them, saying, Ye shall not fear other gods nor bow yourselves to them, nor serve them, nor sacrifice uh, to them. So he gives them four things that they weren't supposed to do. Don't, don't do this regarding other gods. Uh, number one, you're not to fear them. Number two, uh, you're not to bow to them. Number three, you're not to serve them. And number four, you're not to do sacrifice uh, to them. So all this is in uh, verse 35. Don't do those things. Don't fear the other gods. Don't bow to them. Don't serve them. Don't sacrifice to them. Then in verse 36, this is what you're to do. But the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt with great power and a stretched out arm, him shall ye fear. You are to fear God. And him shall ye worship. And to him shall ye do sacrifice. So now the Lord in verse 36, uh, he gives them some things they are to do in regard to the Lord. Don't do the things in verse 35 with these other gods, but to the Lord your God... Uh, you're to fear him, you're to worship him, it was bound to happen. <laughs> you should see me trying to write, a, write a, on a, a birthday card with a pen. <laughs> it's like Charlie Brown and his pen pal, you remember? I know why he had a pencil pal instead of a pen pal. Anyway. And then, to the Lord you're to do sacrifice. Uh, 
All right, so that's what they're supposed to. You don't do these things of the heathen gods. You do this uh, to the Lord your God. So reading through this some, some years ago, uh, as I, sometimes it takes a while, you know, to get it. And, and there's still a whole bunch I don't get. But, uh, but I look forward to reading the scriptures and finding some of those things, you know. But, but, but I got reading through this, and I, and I got to notice, and as I went through verse 36, I found some similarities to verse 35. There were some matching elements. For example, um, fear matched up. We're not to fear, or they weren't to fear. This goes for us as well. You're not to fear other gods, but you're to fear the Lord your God. And then I found uh, this matched up. You're not to do sacrifice to other gods. You are to do sacrifice to the Lord your God. Now, in the New Testament times, we don't do the um, same Old Testament animal sacrifices that they do. And uh, we don't have to do a Passover sacrifice because Christ, our Passover, sacrificed for us. And yet, um, there are spiritual sacrifices. Uh, you can read about some of them in Hebrews chapter 13, uh, with uh, which God is well pleased. So, so I noticed that these things matched up. And then when I, when I looked for these, I figured, okay, the Lord's telling you, don't do these things to the heathen gods, but, but, but do those to your God. And as I looked for, for these two, I, they weren't there. Matter of fact, there weren't four elements in verse 36. There was only three. And where I would have expected to see two more, instead I see just one. I see this here. Now, in the Bible, what the Lord does sometimes to define his terms for us is he, he, he defines them by a virtue of replacement or substitution when you compare passages. Um, just for an example, and I, if, if, if we're going to spend all night, I take and show these, but I'll just give you the references. You can look, at, look them up. Uh, here's the references. Psalm 2, verse 2, and Acts 4, 26. You have a reference in Psalm 2, verse 2, about the Lord's uh, anointed. Um, I actually just get you at least a real quick reading, but... But Psalm 2 and verse number 2, it says, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying. In Acts chapter 4, 26, you have that verse quoted, but instead of saying anointed, the Lord uses the word Christ, showing you what the word anointed means and what the word Christ means. Christ means anointed. Years before I knew that the King James Bible in English taught you that, I would have people try to explain that. You know, that's what it means in, in Hebrew. Christ, it means in Hebrew, it means anointed. Well, guess what? That's what it means in English, too. <laughs> How do you know that? Because God showed me. He showed, he showed me. Same thing I, I was taught about the word spew. Um, people would be talking about how God would spew out the Laodicean church. Preachers would be talking about it. Uh, he'll spew the Laodicean church out of his mouth, and they would say in the Greek, that means vomit. And, it, and, and again, I found out in the English, it means vomit as well. And you learn that from comparing Leviticus chapter 18, verse 25 with Leviticus chapter 18, verse 28, where the one time he says uh, vomit, and the other time he says spew. Um, a couple others, sanctify, you're taught, means set apart, because that's what it means. But you learn that from Exodus 13, verse 2 and verse number 12. Or one time he'll use sanctify, and the other time he'll use set apart, talking about the same thing in the same context. That those two verses also, also show you that the word matrix is not a movie. <laughs> that the word, the word matrix means a womb. And you get that from comparing the scripture with the scripture. So understanding how God does that a lot, um, I understand and understood going through here the Lord was doing the same thing in these verses. Instead of saying you're not to, uh, to, instead of saying like he said here, you're not to fear, bow, serve, and sacrifice to the heathen gods, he simply said you are to fear, you are to worship, you are to sacrifice to God. Notice he started verse 36 with the conjunction, the word but. You're, 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 you're not to do these things with other gods, but you're to do them with the Lord your God. And so instead of saying bow and serve, he just said worship. And by doing so, he showed us what basically and very simply worship is. And very simply, again, in its most basic and rudimentary elements, to worship is to bow and to serve. It's very helpful to, uh, practically uh, to be able to get this truth. Worship is really all about those two things, bowing and serving. And as we go through these verses, to me, it helps fix that uh, in my, my awareness. 
whether you worship false gods like the heathen do, or whether you worship the true and living God of the Bible, your worship consists of spending time bowing before that God, as well as spending time serving that God. So for us who worship the true God, if we would truly worship him and worship him in spirit and truth, we should be both spending time bowing before him and then also serving him. When it comes to worship and these two elements, many people get one of the elements down and emphasize it, but not the other. Let's talk about the two elements, for example, as how they ought to be. We'll start with, uh, with bowing. Uh, that's where he started here in verse 35. What is bowing before the Lord? Bowing before the Lord, um, it speaks to, to some of these things and, and more, but um, to, to holding him in, in reverence and awe. Now, sometimes literally to bow down upon your face, uh, bow down and pray, uh, bow down or lay yourself pros, pro, down on the ground, you know, up, flat on your face before the Lord. And um, uh, so, so bowing has to do with that. It's, it's having that awe, that reverence, that praise, uh, coming before him in humility, uh, coming before the God of creation and really recognizing him as the omnipotent God that he is. It's the wonder and the adoration that you hold uh, for him, the exaltation uh, that you give the Lord God Almighty. Again, kneeling before him in prayer, bowing before him in prayer, uh, sitting before him uh, with his word in front of your face and, and reading and feeding uh, from that word. Uh, bowing, it, it's being still and knowing that he is God. Um, it is at times and um, of necessity at times, it is repentance and confession and lowliness before the Holy One of Israel as you confess your sin to God and seek to get it right. Bowing before him. It's you, the creature, taking your rightful place before God, the creator, recognizing it as such. It's, it's weakness bowing before omnipotence. It's the student sitting at the feet of the master uh, um, in his omniscience. Uh, it's mortality lying uh, prostrate before the eternal God. It's a saved sinner singing and speaking the praises of his Savior like we did um, corporately here tonight uh, as a church and like you ought to do privately in your daily walk and, and worship of the Lord. The scripture um, gives us some further ideas. New Testament, first of all, 1 Timothy 1.17, Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, uh, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. That's exalting him. That's, that's giving him worship. Not just lip service, but from the heart when you get it. Psalm 95, Old Testament, verse 6. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Uh, back in the New Testament, Ephesians 3, 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 10 and 11. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And one day it will. But even now, every knee should bow. Amen. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's bowing. That's what I'm talking about. Those are some of the things that um, have to do with bowing before the Lord in that uh, part of worship. Then, of course, there's also uh, serving. And that's a part of it as well. Serving is getting busy for God. It's, um, it's doing something in the service of the king. Do you ever sing that uh, hymn, I am happy in the service of the king? Um, I'm not sure if it's in this one or not, but uh, it's, a, it's a good hymn. And uh, you ought to be happy in the service of the king, but in order to be happy in the service of the king, you're going to have to be in the service of the king. Right. And then you're going to have to be in the service of the king and being happy. There are those that aren't in the service of the king, so they're not happy in the service of the king. Then there are some that are in the service of the king and not happy about it. Yeah. I mean, it, you ought to be. It's, it's, the, it's the, best, the best thing that you can do on this earth is yeah. to serve your king, king of kings and lord of lords. What is, what is uh, serving? It's taking the talents that God has given you and using them, uh, those talents and those gifts, for the honor and the glory of God. There's all different kinds of things it might entail. Um, it might, for some, entail uh, playing an instrument in church, uh, maybe singing a special uh, in church. Uh, it might involve you know, cleaning or fixing or uh, helping uh, keep in order the facilities uh, that you meet in. It might involve a preaching, extension preaching outside of the church, perhaps in a nursing home or in a rescue mission. Um, it might involve a preaching in a, in, a, in a prison ministry, like Brother Steve talking about uh, tonight, or, or in a jail, county jail ministry or something like that. 
uh, a lot of different places that it might, uh, it might open up. Uh, it might involve uh, preaching in the street and uh, getting out there and publicly proclaiming uh, what the Bible says and, and preaching the gospel to a lost world out there who needs to know that Jesus cares about them too. It might involve uh, teaching a Sunday school class. It might involve working in the nursery. Somebody's got to watch them kids. Amen. <laughs> um, for all Christians, it should involve witnessing, passing out gospel tracts, trying to win people to the Lord Jesus Christ. See them get saved. Uh, serving furthermore as you, as you get those things down, it also involves answering the call of God on your life. Um, God, God has a calling on every one of our lives. And I don't say that he calls every one of us into what we call full-time service, although we are all called to be full-time Christians. But, but God has a purpose for your life, and if you want to be successful, it's like the old preacher years ago, Bob Jones Sr., used to say, um, a successful man is a man that finds out the will of God for his life and does it. What, what better could you do than that? And, and so for some, uh, answering the call of God upon their life, it, it might mean that they uh, are a missionary, like some of the missionaries that we support and, and pray for and that you support and that you pray for. For some, it might be a, a pastor. For some, it could be an evangelist. Um, for some ladies, it could be um, a, a wife of, of one of these, serving the Lord in that capacity. For some, again, it doesn't involve any of these things, but it involves becoming a, a, being involved in a local church like you have here tonight and being a good member and a faithful member of a local New Testament Bible-believing church. Serving is you spending your time, your energy, and, and putting forth uh, effort in, in the, some of the free time of your life in the service of the King of Kings. Jesus uh, set the example. Matthew 20, verse 28, I believe. He said, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus set the example. He who, he who, who really ought to have been served made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and, and was obedient unto God, fulfilling his will. Serving the Lord also involves being a clean vessel for the Lord. Like it says um, in Isaiah 52, 11, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. As servants of the Lord, we ought to be clean. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, he puts it like this, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, those dis dishonorable and unclean things, if a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use. Uh, I remember early on in my Christian life, people used to talk a lot about being used of God. They wanted to be used of God. There's even a song that says, to be used of God, to sing, to speak, to pray. To be used of God, to show someone the way. I long so much to feel the touch of his consuming fire. To be used of God is my desire. Well, we've gotten a long way from that. We've gotten to the place where people don't want to be used of God. They want to use God. And if God doesn't come through the way they want him to come through, then, you know, they're down the road. Well, you ought to have a desire for God to use you, to be an instrument in his hands to use. And if you want to be, as it says here, sanctified and meet for the master's use, then you purge yourself from the unclean things of this earth. As he says also in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, "...having therefore these promises, dearly beloved..." Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. And uh, Psalm 2, verse 11, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. This is serving. These are all the things that, that it's involved with serving, or a lot of the things. Serving is the second ingredient in today's, um, in today's recipe. Uh, bowing and serving, when properly combined, uh, yield worship. The essence of worship then again is to bow before the Lord and then to get up and to serve Him. And then after you do that, to go back and bow before Him again and get up and serve Him again. And after you do that, to maintain that thing. To maintain Him daily in your relationship with the Lord. Maintain that, that worship and then get out and do something uh, with that worship. But I've, I'm in danger of just going off on a whole bunch of different um, bunny rabbit trails about this thing right here. 
But let me just tell you, it is important. Now, you don't want to just become, you don't want to just take in and become Bible bloated. What happens to us if we eat and eat and eat and we never move off the couch? <laughs> we become big old gigantic couch potato. And you've got to, you've got to utilize what God's given you. Or, um, or you won't be much use uh, for the master. So uh, we are to be um, not only hearers of the word, but doers. And when it comes to these two elements, as I said before, there are some people that get the one without the other. And there's some that think really worship is, is only one and not the other. You know, there are groups of people, Christians, ministries, that think worship is only bowing. They think that's the essence of worship in and of itself. They think that it's only the worship uh, of, of praising God, of exalting Him, uh, of giving Him adoration, of lifting their hands up to God, uh, reverencing Him, uh, or, or even just attending a church worship service. They think that is the end-all and the be-all of worship, and that's all that it is. And the fact of the matter is, um, though they think that that alone is the essence of worship, um, it's only part of it. Uh, there are others who think that worship really is just service. Um, there, were, there were groups of, of, of churches, I imagine, still around that they think really that's all that it is. It's just serving, serving, serving. What you do for God, getting involved in the ministry, working and, and laboring for the church, they think that's what worship is, reaching uh, people, ministering to others. And they think that the essence of worship is only serving God. But the truth that, again, is a lot unlocked in these verses is it's, it's not one to the exclusion of the other. It is both. You've got to have both. You've got to have that balance. Look, if all you do is reverence and exalt and stand in awe of God, you're off to a good start, but you're only halfway to your destination. Right. And if all you do is serve, 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 again, you only got half the equation because the equation is bowing plus serving equals worship. Right. Uh, in Luke chapter 10, we find uh, two ladies. Their names are uh, Mary and Martha. I coincidentally um, read about them again in the course of my um, normal Bible reading today, last, last um, uh, chapter in that normal Bible reading in Luke chapter 10, I happen to uh, be in today. Mary and Martha, e in each of these ladies, as we look at them separately, we see, by, by virtue of what God emphasizes about them in the passage, we see half of this equation. Uh, Mary, she had the first half. Now, no, we're not saying Mary didn't have the second half, but, but the Lord highlights the first half in Mary's life. She had the first half. She sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Uh, Martha, she had the second half. Uh, Martha was, uh, she was good at serving. Uh, she jumped in with both feet and, and hit the ground running, and she was serving. You know, if, if one person would combine both of these elements, who would properly worship the Lord? Um, one preacher said back in the day, it might have been uh, Bob Gray back in the day, said, what we need is some Mary Marthas. <laughs> and that um, place I was telling you about, I was preaching at the boys' home in, uh, South, in Mississippi, uh, that man that was running that home, he had a daughter that he named Mary Martha. <laughs> so, I mean, he, he was he, trying to incorporate that thought. And, uh, and that's a good, Id good idea. But, but again, it's just uh, what we're trying to say is you need both of those elements. If you examine the story of Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10, uh, toward, right there at the end of the chapter, you're going to see that when the Lord talks about the two, he talks about Mary first sitting at Jesus' feet. And then he talks about Martha serving. Mary first, sitting at his feet, Martha serving second. The order is telling. As a matter of fact, it matches the order here. Here he talks about bowing. That'll match Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. First, and then serving second. The order is telling because that's the order that we got to do it, like I said before. By, it's when you bow at the Lord's feet and you spend time alone with him that you get the strength to properly serve God. The sitting at his feet, the feeding on his word, the maintenance of a proper relationship with God, that's what's going to give you the strength and the power to serve him and to serve him well. Uh, those that serve, 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 and serve and don't sit at Jesus' feet, uh, they face certain dangers. Let's go with me. If you, would you go with me? We'll go to Luke chapter 10. Look just uh, real quick at uh, something here. A few things here. Luke chapter 10. Again, we'll get right down there to the end of the chapter. Luke 10.
verse number 40. Luke 10 and verse number 40. And here's Martha. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. Now you read through this passage, I don't know how you picture, but I picture Martha, you know, just pulling her hair out and right about ready to scream, ah, I'm just going to lose it. And, and here, here she is. Uh, well, you know, Martha needed, Martha needed a bit more of Mary. And the Lord told her so. Look at verse 41. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. You know, if you start where Mary started, the natural progression will be that you'll get up and you'll serve. Right. If you start where Martha started without visiting Mary's place at Jesus' feet, you get, um, well, you're in danger of uh, burning out. And have we not seen in certain fundamental circles, especially uh, people that do that, that all they do is they hit the ground running, serve, 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 and they don't stop to take time at Jesus' feet. I'm thinking of um, uh, a, a guy who was pastoring, uh, who used to come around these parts and has even been in our church and preached, and then uh, he kind of made a mess of things. And uh, after making a mess of things, he sent out a, uh, a cassette tape, kind of apologizing to people. And uh, as he uh, spoke about what happened, he said, he said, my problem is I just got going and going and so busy and busy that I didn't take time to just get alone with God. And boy, he made a mess of things. And, 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 and again, he, he, he burned out, and that's a real danger. That you, you hear that about people in the ministry, the danger of just burning out. And uh, I have heard um, some Christians and some preachers proclaim when it comes to this, they'd say, uh, well, I'd rather burn out than rust out. And I understand the sentiment, and I suppose if I had to choose between the two, I'd rather burn out than rust out. But who says you have to choose between the two? Because what? You're still out. <laughs> uh, wouldn't it be better to just uh, get in it for the long haul and go as long and as strong as you can possibly go till the Lord comes back or till the Lord takes you home and just keep on fighting the good fight of faith as long as possible. Notice some of the things that are inherent and, and what Mary or what Martha faced in her turmoil of, uh, of burning out and being coming about much serving is much what God's people today face. Uh, here she is in verse 40. Uh, here she is. Martha was cumbered about uh, much uh, serving. So uh, she, she uh, does all of this without taking time to, to, to sit at the Lord's feet. And what happens? Well, she becomes critical of her sister who wasn't serving like she was. She says, uh, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? What happens to God's people? They just get serving and serving and serving. Don't take time to fill up with the, the Lord and have the and, and serve from the strength and the power that He gives within. And they start looking around at their brothers and sisters, being critical of them. Well, I'm doing all this and they ain't doing nothing. And about that time, you kind of lost your spirituality or left it back there uh, down the road somewhere. She became uh, overly burdened. Jesus said, "Thou art careful, full of care." Literally, uh, "Thou art careful." Verse 41 and troubled about many things. So she became um, overly burdened. Also in doing this, she questioned the Lord's care for her. Did you notice that in verse 40? She says, uh, but Martha, it says, but Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care? Dost thou not care? Well, well yeah, he cares. Of course he cares. But uh, she thinks he doesn't. And then she thinks she's the only one doing anything. She says, Dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Nobody else is doing anything. It's just me. I know another guy who went through that. Um, Elijah under the juniper tree. Right. It's just me, Lord. It's just me. All the prophets, everybody else is apostate. And I, I own and left a, a servant of, of you. And the Lord had to enlighten him and said, uh, <coughs> settle down there, Elijah. I got me 7,000 left that haven't bowed the knee to the image of Baal uh, or kissed him. And sometimes we think it's just us. God's got his people all over the place, folks. 
And we're just sometimes spread out a little bit thin. But they're there. We're not the only ones doing it. God got a hold of people, and people got a hold of God. Uh, just plant yourself where you are and, and bloom where you're planted. Um, like one preacher said uh, years ago, go where you're sent uh, and stay where you're put and give what you got. <laughs> and that's what you ought to do. So, again, I, I have learned from the scriptures if we want to keep going for the long haul and we got to balance our spiritual life properly by combining the bowing and the serving. First, sitting at Jesus' feet. Again, that's number one, sitting at his feet like Mary, bowing like it says here first, and then serving. This is the order of the first and great commandment as well, is it not? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment. That's number one. The second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That's the servant, getting out there and ministering to other people. Uh, God has this outline for us also in the Ten Commandments. In the Ten Commandments, you know what he says? Uh, wait, well, without going through all ten of them, the first four are directly to your, to your relationship with God. Right. It's you and God. The last six are your relationship with others. So this is always the, always the order. So, so learn it and, and remember it. And, and let's never forget, we're to bow first, serve, and then after we serve, go bow again. And, and over and over again, that's how you're going to maintain your strength. That's how you're going to make it in this messed up world. That's how you're going to keep from burning out. That's how you're going to keep from, um, from fighting amongst yourselves. That's how you're going to keep from getting critical about other people because you think you're the only one doing something for God. Would you worship God? We would call ourselves worshipers of God. Let's make sure that we have these things in the proper order. For the essence of worship is real simple. It's to bow to the Lord and then to get up and serve Him. And then go back and do it again and again and again until Jesus comes or until he calls you home. So now let's go ahead and we'll bow our heads and we'll pray. Father, I thank you tonight for your word, the richness of it, Lord, the depths of it. I thank you for, for, for giving us things that'll, that'll help us. You haven't left us down here helpless. You've given us your book. You filled us uh, and, and, and sealed us with your spirit. And uh, you offered us the throne of grace where you can come anytime, any, any day, any, any place and uh, receive the mercy and the grace that we need, the grace to help in time of need. So help us to take advantage of these things. Help us, Lord, to remember the simple uh, pattern that you've laid out and to serve you faithfully uh, as long as we possibly can. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, let's uh, go ahead and bow our heads, close our eyes, spend a little bit of time in prayer. Just uh, think about where you fit in. Think about where you were before you heard this message and how this message would, would apply to you. Did you have the service before the bowing? Did you have just the bowing or did you have just the service? Where were you before you first came in here? We've got a clear presentation of what worship is, and how different it is to what uh, modern Christianity has put forth. Modern Christianity wants to put it more in the emotion than they do in the practicality of what real worship is, bowing, acknowledging God, giving him honor and praise, lifting up his name and, and humbling yourself before the mighty God and then tying that in with actual service. How many Christians just leave off the service and just want to come in and make a show? Here you've seen what it is, what the scripture defines as being worship. And those are things that we really need to contemplate and think about. And hopefully by the grace of God we'll make some changes and make the, the right, put it in the proper priorities and let God have his way with you. That we might worship properly, we might get the right balance, we might not uh, wear out <laughs> and rust out and burn out. We might be able to serve the Lord all the days of our life and not fall away from him and, and be accounted as nothing. 
the Lord's good, and his mercy is great. Let me just read something, your heads bowed, eyes closed, just contemplate this. Psalm 145, we used this here not too long ago. It says, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. That tells it right there. That's worship, bowing and going out and serving. And that's what we need to do. Appreciate the, the message, Brother Strobel, and thank you for what you've done. Uh, you put the work in and uh, brought to us something that we need and appreciate that. Let's go ahead and bow our heads for prayer, and we'll uh, be dismissed as a uh, finish up. Father, thank you for the time that we have here. Thank you for the message. Thank you for the clear instruction. Lord God, I pray that we would be able to put it into our hearts and our minds, in our spirits, Lord, that we'd have the right balance on this. Lord God, that we would indeed worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, that you might receive the honor and the glory and that our lives would, would exemplify that worship in a, in a real way. Lord God, that you'd be pleased with us. Father, I pray that you'd bless this message far beyond, Lord, just the time that we're here. Uh, but Lord, as we go our ways, Lord, that we would uh, allow this to be a practice that we put into place each and every day of our lives. Lord God, that you might receive the honor and the glory, that we would bow ourselves before thee and serve thee with all of our hearts. Father, we exalt you and, and lift you up and praise your name. Thank you for the word of God that gives us this instruction.